I think she enjoyed annoying the Duke of Windsor over that. I think it gave her a kick to see him enraged by it, which he was. I think it gave her a feeling of power, that after all those years she could still make him extremely jealous and angry over another man. But, and this is important, there are suggestions that it was not only Wallace who was attracted to Donahue. I think the Duke was in love with Jimmy, claims the interior decorator Nikki Haslam, who knew the couple during this period. Here's the thing, was he jealous that Wallace was choosing another man? Or was he jealous that that young man was choosing Wallace? Hello, how are you? Welcome to my channel. My name is Cheer Denise. Today we're doing another chapter of Trader King. We're doing chapter 19 today. And this chapter is called Secret Affairs. Now I do wanna put a bit of a warning before I begin this chapter. It is explicit. And I don't say that um, even to tantalize you, but there may be some people in the audience who don't wanna hear about the menage a trois. Um, the, uh, some of the talk that we're gonna read describing some of the activities between the partners is crude. So if that's not your cup of tea, I totally understand that, but I just wanna let you know, that's what this episode's about. So um, if you do wanna to listen to it, but you have little ears around, you might not listen to it around them. Okay, secret affairs. Um, it begins by describing the young man to whom this entire situation revolves, Jimmy Donahue. Jimmy Donahue was a 35 year old homosexual man who was the heir to the Woolworth fortune. And Wallace had been introduced to him at a party in 1941 and had really taken a shine to him. And she, at this point in the book, has begun an illicit affair with Jimmy Donahue, even though he is probably, like, let's see, he, he's at least 20 years younger than her and he's a gay man. So it doesn't really make sense what's happening here. But what we get a lot of in this chapter is the fact that much of her behavior as she and the Duke got older was to spite him. For whatever reason, she felt that he had misled her in what he could provide for her. She finds him boring and dull and she wants to hurt his feelings. And so I don't know how much she was into Jimmy and how much she was into hurting the Duke. That's a huge theme. We're also going to be touching on this chapter about the Duke's uh, sexuality himself. There's lots and lots of rumors swirling around what he was about. And there are some people who say that it was repressed. Some people say it was overt. Suffice it to say, these rumors have swirled for years and they have never been squashed and no one has ever been sued for saying them. Even the person who was in charge of his reputation upon his death has never seen fit to sue over those rumors about the fact that he was bisexual. So there's so many stories and it's been allowed to go on for so long. We can surmise that it is true. Anyway, let's begin the chapter. Um, but before we do, hit the like button, um, comment as we go along if you are as surprised as I, and uh, share if you think a friend would enjoy this. All right, here we go. In May of 1950, the couple sailed from New York to France on the Queen Mary. With them was Jimmy Donahue, the 35-year-old heir to the Woolworth fortune and a cousin of the American socialite, Barbara Hutton. The Windsors had got to know Jimmy and his mother, Jessie, in Palm Beach early during the war through a mutual friend. Wallace had been placed next to Jimmy at lunch, and Wallace had been placed next to Jimmy at a lunch on April 18, 1941, and the friendship had developed over the next decade, helped by the fact that the Donahues always picked up the bill. Yeah, that's going to be a huge thing in why they keep hanging out with Jimmy, because Jimmy pays for things. I mean, he is generous, probably to a fault, the very opposite of the Duke. Now, let's get a little sketch of who Jimmy was. An odd bird, if ever there was one. Now, the book says that Jimmy had had an unhappy childhood. His father had committed suicide in 1931, probably over a homosexual affair. So because of his very unhappy childhood, he covered up his sadness with outrageous behavior and attention seeking. A favorite party trick was to put his penis on a dinner plate and ask a waiter to carve it thinly. He took it out. <laughs> He what? He took <gasps> it out. Would you even stand to be around someone like that? Like, I can't understand why this guy was so charming. Everyone's like, oh, Jimmy, Jimmy's charming. Jimmy's so much fun. 
If a guy pulled it out on a dinner plate and told the waiter to carve it, I would flip a table and leave. That is so gross. Like, you know what's surprising to me is how there's not very much difference between the people of the lowest classes and the people of the highest classes in what they will do, sometimes do. It's us people in the middle who are trying to keep things together. But the people at the top and the people at the bottom, sometimes they're functioning on, this, in, on the same wavelength. Okay, so reputedly, his family kept a lawyer on 24-hour call to buy him out of the most dangerous scrapes. As stories circulated of orgies at his mother's Palm Beach estate, the castration of a lover, police investigations into call boys, and drug use. So as you can see, this is a real lovely fella to hang on your arm and get your husband jealous over. Apart from dancing in the chorus of a musical comedy, Hot and Bothered, Jimmy had never had a job, except perhaps as a court jester. And now he had his court, with both the Duke and Duchess captivated by his exuberance and skills as a reconnoiteur. Jimmy intrigued Wallace with his unpredictable and flamboyant behavior and the fact that he was the opposite of her husband. Um, well, I mean, you know, of course he's the opposite. He's 20 years younger than your husband and he isn't former royalty. I'm sure they don't align in very many ways at all. Where Jimmy was carefree and impulsive, the Duke was organized and precise. Where Jimmy was generous, the Duke was penny pinching. Where Jimmy, where Jimmy was exciting and cheerful, the Duke was dull and depressed. Where the Duke reminded her of her age, Donahue made her feel young again. She'd had had to entertain the Duke for the last 13 years and now Jimmy entertained her. Tired of emotionally supporting her husband, she relished being swept up in Donahue's dynamic and spontaneous world. She gave herself willingly to the charms of Jimmy Donahue, says Grace, Countess of Dudley. It's easy to see why he was very amusing. I mean, I don't know, I don't know Jimmy, but a guy who pulls out his penis and puts it on a dinner plate and tells the waiter to carve it doesn't seem like the sort of person I would want to gallivant round town with, lest I too get swept up into whatever current police investigation is raining down on his head. But the book goes on to say that Wallace, who was in her mid fifties and taking stock of her life, felt that she needed someone to pull her out of her own personal depression. Her first husband had died in May and the remarriage of Herman Roger had affected her deeply. She was bored, vulnerable, and flattered by Jimmy's attentions, intrigued by him, his youthful energy and talents. He was a qualified pilot. He could play the piano very well. And supposedly he could sing in half a dozen languages. And she was drawn to him because they shared the same sense of humor and fun. Can you imagine where Wallace is emotionally and mentally if this guy seems like a fit option to distract you from your hard little life? That she has everything she could ever want. And yet she is deciding that she's just gonna spite the Duke. She chose this. She should have just been like, I'm not marrying you if she didn't want to marry the Duke. And now that he's getting older and he's not, you know, he's not young anymore. Now she wants to take up a 35 year old Jimmy Donahue. A court jester is the only way to describe him. It's the, it's the perfect description. He seems like a fool. Okay, well, she was also attracted to him because he's very rich and generous and loved to spend money on her. Throughout that relationship, she amassed a substantial collection of furs. One afternoon, as an example of his generosity, he took her shopping. She picked out 13 dresses and Jimmy footed the bill for $3,105. Now, of course, that, we might want to know what is that in today's money? Oh, just 35,000 pounds. As a publicly gay man, Donahue was also regarded as safe. The friendship now turned into an affair. I just, how do you have an affair with a gay man? I mean, I guess he's choosing to be bisexual for you in this moment, but like, really? What? It's like, of all the people that she could, but then again, she is with the Duke. And as we're going to go on to see, he had tendencies of his own. So maybe this is her type. I don't know. For him, she was a game. And given his detached cold mother, Jessie, he was, she was a maternal figure. There was also a darker side for her. Jimmy also said that she resented the fact that the Duke had lost his throne, wrote Mona Eldridge, who knew the couple. Naively, she had believed his promise of making her queen. She despised his weakness in boring ways. With Jimmy, she found revenge and enjoyed humiliating her husband, in public if necessary. See, that same attitude that we saw come out when she was so mad at Lucy for marrying Herman. I told you we'd see it again. This weird and crazy spiteful behavior because she's bored. She's bored and so now she's going to go out with Jimmy just to make the Duke upset and it did upset him. 
It was a view shared by Kenneth de Courcy. I think she enjoyed annoying the Duke of Windsor over that. I think it gave her a kick to see him enraged by it, which he was. I think it gave her a feeling of power that after all those years, she could still make him extremely jealous and angry over another man. But, and this is important, there are suggestions that it was not only Wallace who was attracted to Donahue. I think the Duke was in love with Jimmy, claims the interior decorator Nikki Haslam, who knew the couple during this period. Here's the thing. Was he jealous that Wallace was choosing another man? Or was he jealous that that young man was choosing Wallace? There's so much emotion mixed up in this. Now, the book's going to go on to describe the evidence of David's own sexual history. Some of it, I feel, is more weighty than others. And you guys, let me know what you think about some of these sources. Now, there have been long rumors of the Duke's bisexuality, which have never been denied. The Duke's biographer, Michael Block, himself gay, insisted that Maitre Bloom, who was the custodian of the Windsor's reputation after their death, never sued if any insinuation appeared in print that he was a homosexual. Anne Seagram, who worked for the Windsors, wrote in her own memoir that the essential point about the Duke's character, his fundamental uncertainty about his sexuality, was his ability to be a heterosexual man. He was fundamentally afraid of women. A similar view was advanced by a psychiatrist interviewed for a Windsor biography. And Dr. Werther believed that the Duke was not a repressed homosexual, but an overt one. He said, there is no doubt that Wales has a strong feminine identification and that it is only with great effort that he can think of himself as a man or feel like one. Many of the Windsor's friends were gay. Somerset Magrum and Noel Coward to the Mendels, from their decorator, John McMullen, to the equestrian, Harvey Ladu, who often acted as the Duchess's escort. I love your pansies, said one guest, uh, looking at the herbaceous border during a dinner party. In the garden, or at my table, replied the Duchess. The Duke, however, never appeared comfortable in the company of gay men. I've always thought that Edward VIII suffered from sexual repression of another nature, wrote Chips Channon in his diary in December 1936. So not repression as far as like, why would he choose Wallace Simpson? You know, she seems cold as a cucumber, but the repression of his desire to actually be with a man. Chips wrote in his diary, his horror of anything even savoring of homosexuality was exaggerated, especially in a world where it is far from unknown. And at the same time, there are tales, I've heard them all my life and some I believe to be half true, which reveal him in quite another light. Certainly too, he has always surrounded himself with extremely attractive men, one knows almost in advance the type of man that he would like. Fruity Metcalf, Dickie Montbatten, Sefton, Mike Wardle, Bruce Ogilvy, and even these he dropped as they aged. Fruity Metcalf, you say? <laughs> Why, yes. Let's see what is revealed about Fruity Metcalf. Remember, that was his friend that clung to him so. Right after the abdication and he was flitting around in Austria waiting for he and um, Wallace to be reunited in marriage. Remember when he was over there being a complete and total ass of a house guest and Fruity Metcalf came there to sort of help him through it? Well, perhaps he was helping him in more ways than we had originally believed. In 2004, updated editions of his biography of Wallace, Charles Higgum reveals that Dudley Forwood had told him that Fruity Metcalf was an active homosexual and they had a physical affair with the Prince of Wales, a revelation that he only wanted made public after Forwood's own death. Oh, it's starting to make so much more sense because didn't you wonder why Fruity was hanging around like that? I was like, man, that is some kind of serious, intense friendship that he would come to the Duke in his time of need over and over and over like this. I was like, wow, he really must not have had anything to do. Well, he found something to do all right. So, so there is this question, knowing this about his past, is it possible that the Duke was attracted to Jimmy? Noel Coward told Truman Capote about Jimmy Donahue. Noel said, I like Jimmy. He's an insane camp, but fun. I like the Duchess. She's the fag hag to end all, but that's what makes her likable. The Duke, however, well, he pretends not to hate me. He does though, because I'm queer and he's queer, but unlike him, I don't pretend not to be. Anyway, the fag hag must be enjoying it. She's got a royal queen to sleep with and a rich one to hump. That's what I'm saying. We've got some interesting language here. But there were always stories. You know, it's not just, oh, well, I heard that him and Fruity Metcalf, you know, it's like, that's one of many, you know, and the book goes on to list about four different examples of his behavior 
and rumors that were swirling around the Duke. One acquaintance said that as a young man, he used to go with boys to Hyde Park, that bit by the barracks, which was a great picking up place for toffs. One day, Prince David came with a friend who approached me on his behalf. They took me to a queer nut club in Seven Dials, run by Elsa Lancaster's sister. Another story said that the Duke was the honorary president of the Austrian Sports and Shooting Club, which German police file suggested was a cover for homosexual activities. The police report said that one royal member has recently fled Vienna because he was under threat of arrest in charges of homosexuality. And the report went on to say that in connection with this, the police report also charges the Duke of Windsor with bisexuality. Interesting, interesting. Then the book goes on to cite several conversations and comments that have been found on gay forums regarding the Duke. I don't know about you. It might just because I'm like extremely old school and I like don't trust the internet even a little bit. For me, getting facts to place in a, what is an exceptionally researched biography off of a gay forum online in some chat room feels like not worthy of our attention. I could be totally wrong and I'm not saying that they're not true stories. I mean, I guess we live in a different age in which primary sources are different. I don't know, but you know, I mean, I guess what's the difference between going to this person and interviewing them and them writing something and you can substantiate that it, you know, it's a real person that wrote this, but I don't know how you, you substantiate it. Like, I don't know how you would track that down. So I will go ahead and tell you the next couple of, of examples that implicate the Duke as having some secret life. But I have to say, I throw a bit of shade at picking up info off of chat rooms on the internet. Um, the book goes on to say that on the Gay Forum Data Lounge, a couple of elderly posters shared anecdotes. One said, we had a good f family friend here who owned a flower shop in our city. In his young childhood, the 1940s, he was part owner of a shop in New York City. His business catered to the society crowd. He told us many great stories over the years. One story he told was how he took care of the fresh flowers for the Duke and Duchess when they were in New York City. Our friend told us that sometimes he would literally be chased by the Duke while taking care of the flowers in their apartment. So, interesting. Um, there's other information about the Duke having a affair with Walter Chrysler Jr., who is a son and founder of the Chrysler Corporation. Walter Jr. was an art collector, museum benefactor, theater and film producer, and he probably met the Duke at Palm Beach Golf Club. Though Chrysler was twice briefly married, his homosexuality was well known. In 1944, he had been forced to resign from the Navy due to wild homosexual parties. 16 enlisted men had signed affidavits that Chrysler, known as Mary, had committed unnatural acts with them and Confidential Magazine had outed him in the 1950s. So with that background information, we go back to Data Lounge, the online forum, where one poster by the name of Charlie wrote that Chrysler Jr. had told him a story about how he and the Duke of Windsor, the former King of England, were throwing a party on a Navy ship docked at Jacksonville, Florida during World War II. The commenter said, he said that there were more than 1,000 sailors and Walter and David hired 200 hookers, but Walter and David I can't even read this, you guys. It's explicit. Walter and David performed so much of one activity that their lips were chapped for a week. Gross, you guys. <laughs> I can't. Chrysler had been based at the Key West Naval Base in Florida between April 1942 and December 1944 and was the subject of an investigation by the Office of Naval Intelligence. Subsequent inquiries revealed that all the investigative files had disappeared. Okay, so... That's the background on David and the fact that David, and we've already kind of covered this already in this book because there was talks and conversations about the fact that he had had an explicit love affair with his cousin. Um, so, I mean, apparently he just does whatever he wants to do. I mean, there's nothing that's going to hold him back. If he, if he feels like doing a certain thing, he will. And it's very interesting because... David was a person who loved protocol, tradition. He, he liked things to be proper and the way they should be. He was a stickler for it. This, this chapter is going to go on and talk about that's how, that, that was his personality. And the people noted that even though he was no longer part of the royal family, he still loved the protocol of royalty, tradition. And yet in his personal life, it's as far from traditional as one could possibly hope to imagine. Okay, back to Jimmy Donahue. Let's get back to that affair. A few days after arriving in Paris, the menage a trois of the Windsors and Donahue went to a charity ball 
in a 17th century mansion, and there were 700 members of Parisian society. The Duke left at midnight. Two of the last guests to leave close to dawn were Jimmy and Wallace. On June 11th, Jimmy celebrated his 35th birthday at Maxime's with the Windsors as the guests of honor. At the end of the month, the Duke and Duchess joined Jimmy and his mother, and the affair continued. The Duke played golf during the day and then retired early, leaving Wallace and Jimmy to spend both the days and evenings together. In November, Wallace returned alone to the United States, while the Duke stayed behind to finish his book, and the affair continued. The designer, Billy Baldwin, noticed that the two lovers began to frequent a restaurant that he often used off Park Avenue on 59th Street. He said after lunch, they would just quietly go to Jimmy's apartment. The Duchess was always well behaved, but a couple of times I saw that she was rather tight because she liked to drink. They were inseparable in New York. And I know that during that time in her life, she had more fun than she ever had before. Well, how is the Duke supposed to make do with this new arrangement in his life? You know, I mean, he was smitten with Wallace. We don't get it, we never will get it, but he was. So for him to be trying to write his memoirs, something he was already struggling to do, well, he knows his wife is off running New York City and having an explicit affair with this 35 year old homosexual. I mean, could you concentrate on writing your, your story? I don't think so. Alone back in Paris, the Duke could not concentrate. For two weeks, he would ring Wallace both at bedtime and first thing in the morning, but whenever he called, the Duchess's maid was unable to say where she was. When he did reach her, his wife simply replied that she's been with friends and she cut the conversation short. Three weeks of her evasiveness brought him to the edge of a breakdown, like a legitimate breakdown, not just like somebody being like, I almost broke down, but like really people thought he was gonna kill himself. After he had opened some press clippings from a news agency addressed to the Duchess, it became clear what was happening. The Duke abandoned the book and decided to go to New York. Murphy, remember poor Murphy, he's the guy from Time Life who's been tasked with getting this book out of the Duke and he has been beside himself this whole time because it has been an arduous journey if ever there was one. He's not about to let the Duke run off to America and solve this marital discord. Uh-uh, we got a book to write, so he follows the Duke. He wanted him to keep working on the book. So concerned was the ghostwriter about the Duke's mental health that he would not allow him on the deck alone at night for fear of his committing suicide. It was the greatest test of the Windsor's 13-year-old marriage. When the Duke finally arrives, the Duchess meets him. She's got her little Karen Terriers with her. Every, you know, they're just laughing like, oh, isn't it crazy that people want to say that there's something wrong with our, with our relationship? Nothing's wrong. <laughs> crazy people. But uh, you can laugh heartily at the published reports that you're estranged and make these public displays of affection, but she continued to see Jimmy all day and all night. I mean, all they did was just, you know, shop and go eat lunch and go have brunch and more shopping. It's like, I can't even begin to understand how this could be entertaining day after day after day after day after day. At Christmas, the three of them attended mass at St. Patrick's Cathedral. The first time since the reign of Charles I that a British monarch or ex-monarch had taken the sacrament from a disciple of Rome. Two days later, the Windsors gave a luncheon for Cardinal Spellman, a homosexual friend of Jimmy's with a pension for cross-dressing. A cardinal, really interesting. All part of Jimmy's mischievous attempt to persuade Wallace to convert to Roman Catholicism. Wow, okay. I don't have comment there. Almost nightly, the Windsors and Jimmy would find themselves at the El Morocco nightclub, but the Duke would leave alone at midnight. And then, and this is crazy, Jimmy came into his own, wisecracking, cavorting, camping, telling naughty stories and gossiping about the other patrons. Next morning, the haggard Duke would make his way to the Duchess's room to assure himself of her safe return, only to be brought up short by a scrawled warning taped to her door. Keep out, stay out. Or sometimes, don't come in here. Everything about his life has failed. Everything about his life has failed. He threw everything away for this woman who would then throw him away so she could have an affair with a 35 year old gay man because he buys her pretty things and takes her to lunch. Can you even begin to imagine how he didn't throw himself off the deck? You, you, you wonder, like at a certain point, I'd just be like, I'm done. I can't, you know, I mean, like, what is he living for? What hope does he have? On Valentine's Day, the Windsors were guests of Jessie Donahue, that's Jimmy's mother, at the Venetian Ball. The gossip was that she had bought the Windsors in the way that she'd seduced the writer and socialite Elsa Maxwell and communist Mari Paul with substantial cash presents as Christmas and birthdays. Wallace had also taken a fancy to another young man, Russell Knipe, 
a 30-year-old actor and singer. Oh, she's going down to 30 now. He was starring with Ethel Merman in Irving Berlin's Call Me Madam. Often he and Merman would join the Windsors for dinner after the show, and the inference in the press was that the relationship with Wallace was more than just friendship. She'd been phoning the young man nightly and sometimes called for him in her car, reporter Walter Winchell said in Man About Town column. Um, yeah, so this whole thing with this 30-year-old guy, it's kind of hazy about what exactly it was. Like, I don't know if maybe she just wanted to get one, yet one more young man on her arm. She loved the look of being surrounded by young men. And so I'm not sure. Some people say there was definitely something going on between them. But this actor's son says that there really wasn't. Like, they just enjoyed each other's company. And that even when the actor went on to get married and had a young family, they stayed friends with the Windsors for the next 20 years. So I don't know, but I mean, at the same time, tradition marks none of these people's behaviors. I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that Wallace was over there having this affair with young 30 year old Nike, uh, but then later he got married and had a family and they stayed friends. Like these people function in different ways than we would. So I don't know. But I will go on to tell you that the journalist Alice Motes, researching the story for the columnist uh, Westbrook Pegler, was able to tell him that it seems to be common gossip that she has a crush on a fellow called Knipe who plays in Call Me Madam. The dude goes home at night because he theoretically has to write his book. And as much as he hasn't written a line of it or the life pieces, that seems odd, but there it is. And she plays about in nightclubs with Mr. Knipe. However, things don't seem to be quite as simple as all that. Jimmy Donahue's just written to his boyfriend to tell him that their liaison is over. He has at last fallen in love with a woman, the Duchess, and he's going to marry her. And that I got almost straight from the horse's mouth or whatever. The person who told me had it from Jimmy's boyfriend who confided the story to her in his anguish. So, I mean, I don't know exactly what's going on here, but weird, weird stuff. It's wild to me that somebody who's like 55 would be acting this way. And I guess how else do you act when you don't have any responsibilities? You know, it's not like she's got family, grandkids, her own kids. She does, she's never had a job. You know, what else would you do, I guess, than just party all night long? But it seems weird to me. It seems weird to me that a 55 year old would be going out partying all night with 30 somethings. It's just sad, it's depressing. Are you depressed by this? I'm depressed by this. Well, who can even know what the situation was with night? Because as I previously said, you know, they she remained friends with him for years but you know i i, I kind of have a tendency to feel like it was salacious gossip to say that she had something going on with him because she very evidently had something going on with jimmy so i mean i'm not surprised that people would surmise she also was you know seeing knife on the side but who even knows i don't i but i think that i think her sights were really honed in on jimmy here rumors began to circulate that the duke and duchess's marriage was on the rocks the novelist Rebecca West, who had been mooted as a possible ghostwriter for the Duchess's memoirs, wrote to Ewart Robinson, the right-hand man to Lord Beaverbrook at the Daily Express, I've been thinking very seriously over your letter, and I have come to the conclusion that if what you predict comes to pass and the Duke and Duchess of Windsor part, I would not care to have anything to do with her memoirs. Right, so that's, I mean, that's the gossip. They're, they're not going to make it. And how could anybody think they were making it? She's running around town very evidently with another man. Like, but meanwhile... Even though she wants to act like she's, you know, 30 something and can just stay out all night and party, party, party till the break of dawn. Meanwhile, she's dealing with things that mark her age. Uh, she has cancer again. In February of 1951, Wallace entered the Harkness Pavilion in New York, registered as Mary Walters, where she was successfully treated for cancer of the womb, which required a hysterectomy. She was in the hospital for three weeks, during which the Duke pottered aimlessly around the Waldorf Towers, refusing to see people, and showering her with roses and beluga caviar, which she complained was too salty. Why would you even complain? I mean, the poor guy is trying to do his best. This is the first time I've pitied the Duke. I really, really, really have compassion for him in this chapter, because I know he's the worst on a number of different levels. He's shallow. He's self-centered he's a penny pincher all these things that you're just like oh, yuck, like the worst of humanity but he's a wounded soul like he became this way for a reason i don't know anything about his childhood that would really be something to look into i've heard often enough that he was deeply and horribly abused by his nanny and his parents clearly didn't have the time of day for him and you know he grew up to 
you know, eventually abdicate and then his whole family turns against him. And so he's grasping for this one person who he, he has decided, he has made this narrative that it's this beautiful love story. And he is very childish in his understanding of love. He's, it's, he's very, it's, it's very much like this very passionate, but puppy love almost feeling towards her. Like he just can't even begin to see her for who she truly is. He, all he sees her as, as the fantasy he's created. So can you imagine that you've pinned everything on her, which is of course why she resented him because it's too heavy a weight to bear, but he had, and now to have her running around with somebody who is so inexplicably wrong for her. It's, it's not even like, I mean, it would be one thing if he could understand why she was attracted to him, but he's 35 years old. He's just a, a little party animal. He's, he, he's quite literally a court jester. He's, you know, and he, he, and he's gay on top of all of that. Like it would just be so clear that she was choosing him just to say, he's everything you aren't. And I hate you. I, I just, I hardly understand how he got out of bed in the mornings. Okay, so there he is trying to earn her love as she recovers from her hysterectomy. Well, as soon as she finished that up, getting, I mean, she recovered real, real quick because there she is getting caught up in February, but by May, she's already jumped back up on the Queen Mary to go find out what Jimmy's doing because he's with them too. And the book says that their relationship continued. She's literally just got back from having hysterectomy, but she can't find Jimmy fast enough. She said... The, uh, the book says that the, the affair was as hot and heavy as ever, especially when the Duke paid a week's visit to London, where he desperately went around the antiques fair trying to find gold snuff boxes to go with the collection that Jimmy had given to Wallace. I mean, it's, he's pathetic. He's pathetic. And that's the word that is so often used to describe him by everybody. He's pathetic. And it is pathetic. Your wife is having an affair with this 35-year-old gay man. He gives her these snuff boxes. And you are then, well, she's off having the affair. You're running around London being like, I wonder if I could find some more of those pretty little gold stuff boxes. So, because I think she really liked them. Jimmy gave her some. And I, I think I could maybe get in with her if I could find some more to go with the collection. It's just like... Oh. Please stop, please stop, stand up for yourself. If, she, if he were to throw it all into her face and be like, get the f out of here with this. You and Jimmy, out. I actually think she would have found that extremely attractive. But she hates him because he's pathetic. But he's pathetic because he loves her. It's just this horrible, horrible, horrible circle. Diana Cooper continued to provide a useful commentary on the Windsor's behavior from a succession of dinner parties. Oh, she's always good for a word. She said that during this time, Wallace no longer referred to David as the Duke, which she used to insist that everyone do and show him that honor. Now, she said that Wallace referred to the Duke as my romance with a funny tone, not sneery, but not straight. So they all go out to this nightclub one night. They're joined by Jimmy, who, you know, rushes up into the place shouting, singing and yelling, hit it up, hit it up. And then he goes over to the pan piano and he's playing Rachmaninoff. And then they're in the car on the way back. And Jimmy turned to Diana and said, I adore Wallace. She knows she's only got to call on Jimmy and I'll do anything for her. I love her. Like my mother, you know, not any other way because they're not that sort. But after this conversation, Diana Cooper relates that for the first time, she felt sorry for the Duke. She says, isn't it all desperately sad? He showed nothing, I have to admit, on his royal weasoned face. But if it's true and he learns it, the wife is gone, the legend dead. He'll have to throw himself off the Empire State Building. Yeah, poor, poor David. I mean, really and truly to sit there in the car and listen to this guy go on and on about your wife and you know full well stuff is going on. He can't bear to look it straight in the face. He wouldn't dare in his mind go there. Of course, he lives with the anxiety because his body knows it even if his mind doesn't know it. So he's over there just driving himself into the grave with worry about it, even if he won't articulate it to himself. But he's got to know. And even if he never let himself go there in his mind with what they were actually doing, he knows how it makes him feel when the Duchess is so cold towards him. In July, Jessie chartered a boat with the Windsors as her guests. 
The yacht was not sufficiently large to carry all of Wallace's wardrobe, so her maid, Ophelia, and the Duke's valet followed the yacht along the coast in the Windsor's black Cadillac with a van, carrying the luggage. That's your hint right there, you got too much. If you're staying on a yacht with a bunch of other people and yet you can't find enough space in order for you to have all of the outfits and clothes and all the trinkets and junk you wanna bring along. Each evening, Ophelia would bring on board the outfit for the evening and the next day. The grandiosity is just ridiculous. I mean, I just, I'm up to here with it. The affair was now blatantly obvious. So it's no longer like, could it be? Is it happening? I don't know. I saw them one time, maybe. <laughs> Everyone knows it now. The obviousness of the affair and the fact that everyone now knew it excited Jimmy and Wallace. The fact that they were humiliating the Duke was kind of what got them off. I mean, you guys, the things that they would do are so gross. Like this is disgusting behavior. This would be disgusting behavior if these were like 20 somethings. This is a 55 year old woman and a 35 year old man. And they are at a fancy luncheon. And this is what they decide to do. It says here, lunching with Lady Kenmar in her villa, Wallace made an excuse that she wanted to show Donahue the view from the first floor guest room. They disappeared upstairs. Meanwhile, the Duke remained at the lunch table reminiscing about his time as monarch. The embarrassed guests knowing the Duchess was having it off with Jimmy in one of the upstairs guest rooms. Gross. That is so gross. That behavior is disgusting. And I'm not even talking about the fact that she's upstairs having sex in somebody else's house, you know, but I'm talking about the fact that everybody at the table knows that's what she's doing and that her husband knows that's what she's doing. And then he's sitting there reminiscing about when he was a monarch while his wife is upstairs doing it with a gay guy. Like, what is this that his life has become? All right, well, in Perfino, which they used to visit each year, the royal couple were guests of the actors Rex Harrison and Lily Palmer, who had a house there. The, the Winters had first met this couple in New York, and the Duke had really taken a shine to Palmer because she spoke German like he did. So the Duke, in the middle of boisterous parties, would seek her out so that he could, in a quiet corner, recite G German poetry with her. So uh, an interesting friendship there. And Palmer remembered that although it was 20 years since he had abdicated, he liked to see protocol observed. Only you had to guess when to observe it and when to ignore it. Naturally, you had to be punctual to the minute and stand up whenever he stood up. Even if he was only going to the toilet, respectful attention was drawn to a function that common people preferred to attend to as inconspicuously as possible. And when you greeted him, a little bob or rudimentary cursey was appreciated. I only bobbed to him. His duchess got a firm handshake. She said that entertaining him was sometimes awkward and odd. His sense of humor on the subject was disturbing. You know, he once said to me with a smile, I've got a low IQ. Oh, but sir, I protested loyally. Just think of your book, A King's Story. That's a fascinating tale and very well written. Oh, I didn't write it myself, he said. Anyway, that's all I know. I mean, it would just be like, how do you have a conversation with somebody like that? It's, it's odd and it's awkward and it's like, Mm, oh, okay. Well, good book anyway, though. I mean, it's like, how, how does the conversation keep going? And by the way, it's very interesting that he would confess to her that he did not write it because later on when we talk about that memoir, the press tour that he did was based largely on the fact that I wrote it myself, every word. I worked like a dog on that thing. You know, and he goes on to tell about like this arduous schedule he had to keep up. Anyway, he confessed to her he didn't write a word of it. The Duke and Palmer always talked in German and he confessed to her that he had never felt at home in England. When I first set foot on American soil as a very young man, it came to me like a flash. This is what I like. Here I'd like to stay. And when I married an American, I hoped we would live in America. But as fate would have it, my wife hates America and only wants to live in France. And that's the way it goes. So. Oh. Poor thing. I mean, this is like every turn of the way, his life is just a massive disappointment. Now, the two, these two are just old and gross and weird. I mean, the book continues to just describe in detail just the weird ways that they are. Just one night uh, during the Windsor's visit, Greta Garbo and her longtime companion, George Sheely, were in Portofino, and the Harrisons invited them to meet with the Windsors. So they're all sitting around and then talking about 
in the event that a film was ever made about the Windsors, who should play them? And the Duchess is like, oh, Catherine Hepburn. Like right off, she knew who was going to play her. But then everyone was silent about who was going to play the Duke. Wallace certainly didn't have an answer. And then Windsor nodded politely in Rex's direction and said, I think perhaps you would be the best choice. And it's like, well, but why? They don't even look alike. You know, it's just like, was he just trying to be nice? It's like, just nobody knew how to talk around these two because they didn't ever say anything that made any sense. Okay, well, upon saying that, Rex decided to show the Duke how very little he liked him. Rex, in their open U.S. Army Jeep, drove the Windsors from their villa, perched high above the town, down the perilously steep goat track to the harbor, the Duke clutching the windshield. Don't you ever have the seats recovered? Said Wallace reproachfully, settling gingerly in her white dress on the lumpy back seat as if she were about to sit on a raw egg. Returning, Rex, who didn't like the Duke, muttered gleefully, nearly lost a little bugger on that curve. The next day, the Harrisons with Greta and Sheely joined the Windsors on their yacht moored in the harbor to find Wallace furious because Jimmy had not yet returned from the port. At that moment, Jimmy appeared in the doorway, hellowing exuberantly in all directions, his arms full of gardenias, which he deposited grandly on the Duchess's lap by way of a peace offering. She swept them to the floor and stood up and said, Do you know what time it is? So clearly she's jealous because she thinks he's been having his heyday over there in the port. And she's probably right. Now... This was all very awkward for everybody else to see her so swept up in anger and indignation that her lover boy was not there when she arrived. But the evening got progressively worse and so awkward and strange. Who, what has happened with the Duke and the Duchess and their lifestyle? So the only other guest who was on the yacht was this former American senator and his wife. And this guy, I don't know if he was drunk. I don't know if he was just crazy. I think he was both. He was carrying on about his pet aversion the British who over and over again had sacrificed innocent American boys to save their empire. And as an isolationist, I guess they thought that he was within his rights to say that, but that's bad manners at this party that, you know, the former king of the empire is sitting right there. It's just, it's very awkward. And Jimmy tried to change the subject without success. But then he does something that is just so bogus and stupid. I'm not surprised Wallace was annoyed with it. Now, in order to divert attention, he rose from the table and, still dressed in his midnight blue velvet dinner jacket, leather pumps, and diamond cufflinks, casually jumped into the sea. The Duke was stunned. Oh, but there must be protocol. The crowd in the harbor howled with delight at the sight of Jimmy swimming in the harbor, which was full of refuse, dead rats, and condoms. Oh! Oh, that's disgusting. Oh, I can't handle it. Oh, I just like, that is so foul. Wallace's jaws were clenched and her nose white with shock and anger. That boy has no manners, she finally managed to say. And I'd like to ask you all not to speak to him when he comes back. We'll just act as if nothing has happened. Jimmy now returned in a green velvet dinner jacket to discover the senator still droning on. Well, I've tried again. And once more, he leapt into the water. It was the end of the dinner party. The guests left silently, while the hosts engaged in a passionate conversation in the library. What a way for the night to end. Jimmy over there, drenched with condoms and dead rats. Everybody else just sort of like silently leaving this very awkward and awful evening. The Duchess being just so uncomfortably jealous about everything to do with Jimmy. It's just so gross. Well, the Windsors now moved on in their many, many vacation spots. And Doreen Spooner was sent to photograph the Duke, but she was not impressed by the couple. She said it was so hard to see why a king had abdicated his throne for that woman. I didn't take to her at all. The shots were taken out in the garden by the villa. As with so many photographs taken of them, the couple seemed to have an agenda of showing how blissfully happy they were and that the crisis that rocked the monarchy had all been worth it. The ex-king, Edward VIII, though quite formal in manner, was pleasant and willing to please, but ex-Mrs. Simpson wasn't. She was brittle, angular, devoid of all warmth. She smiled to the camera, but like a robot, there was no feeling behind it. Yeah, everything to do with these people is such a show. And I think that's the thing that would be so tiresome about them is that nothing that they are doing is honest. You know, they, they can't even, they can't even have an honest marriage. She's running around, like even the fact that she's running around with somebody who isn't even heterosexual, he's a homosexual. Like everything that they do is just off kilter and strange. By September, the Windsors were back in Paris and under surveillance by the French Secret Service. When the Duke left for London at the end of the month to see George VI, who'd been operated on to have his left lung removed, the relationship with Donahue continued. 
So anytime he's out of town, she's getting Jimmy to come over. Even when he is in town, she's not being very discreet about it. But why would she be? That's the whole point. She's trying to hurt his feelings. Anyway, the Secret Service are watching uh, the Duchess. And in one report, they said D James Donahue, said to have had an affair with her for four years, rolls up in the evening and takes her to the Paprika restaurant and then to a nightclub where there's a cabaret. Donahue returns to the Duchess's home with her at 2.20 a.m. and then he is seen leaving at 5 a.m. So, of course, as one does wonder and one's mind does wander, what kind of affair could these people possibly be having? What are they doing in these closed rooms? Well, the book tells us. It's explicit, just letting you know. The nature of the physical relationship between Wallace and Jimmy intrigued people. According to Billy Baldwin, Jimmy once, when drunk, had tried to circumcise himself with a penknife, which made intercourse painful, and therefore they relied on sex. According to one biographer, Donahue had claimed Wallace as the best at that certain activity. I will not use the words he describes because I would rather not sully my own mouth with it. Some said they had sex, but I can't believe Jimmy was into all that thought Nikki Haslam. He enjoyed her company. There was no way that Jimmy would have done that with a woman. He was just so gay. But then another historian, an art historian said, oh, they did have sex. And he says he asked about it. He said, I asked Jimmy Donahue when he was drunk and ready to say anything. So what was it like going to bed with the Duchess of Windsor, says Richardson. And he said, it was like going to bed with a very old sailor. E horrifying. Can you imagine if that's what somebody said about you? Oh. Okay, so it's all just horrific now. I mean, I just, it's gross. It's gross. Isn't it gross? Like, you guys, isn't it gross? That's all I can keep thinking about is that this is not a life to live. God forbid it if any of us get to the age of 55 and this is all we have to show for ourselves. Now, the American journalist Cy Sulzberger often met the Windsors during the 1950s. And he said of the Duke, He's curious, and he's somewhat a, a pathetic fellow. There's that word again. He wrote in his diary that although he has, of course, given up any rights to the throne, he still maintains a strict atmosphere of court etiquette. There is much curtsying and bowing, despite the fact that he's extremely informal and friendly. The Duke had just returned from a trip to London, and Sulzberger was touched by his obvious affection for Wallace. He said, after dinner, we were sitting together talking, and every now and then, when he would look across the room at the Duchess, he would say, wasn't well, she wonderful? It's just wonderful to see her. You know, I've been away for a week. Isn't she charming? And you wonder, is he saying that because he's trying to convince himself of it? Or does he really find her to be charming? Salzberger, though, goes on to paint yet one more portrait of David just being odd. He's an eccentric weirdo. After dinner, there was a pianist. The Duke was transported with joy. He played a few songs rather badly and joyfully imitated the playing of various instruments, such as the cello and the violin, waving his arms around like a happy schoolboy. The Duke drank a bit and seemed just slightly tight at the end of the evening. He talked steadily during dinner. At one point, the Duchess leaned over the table and said, you promised you were going to listen tonight because there's a lot of brains around, but you were talking all the time. How condescending. And he had replied, oh, I have to talk with her eyes, I'll fall asleep. I mean, the two of those people, like, it would just be weird. Like, anybody who spent any time around them would know that it was all a facade. That they had both made the greatest mistake of their lives by hitching themselves to each other. What a hateful thing to say at the dinner table to your husband. You promised you'd be quiet tonight. There's a lot of brains around here and I don't know why you're still talking. Like, gosh, lady. Chilling on the hate. Now, a few weeks later, Salzburger attended a 10-course dinner given by a UN delegation and including the French Prime Minister, René Pelvin, for what he describes as, quote, a weird collection of social derelicts. <laughs> that has got to be my favorite phrase yet in this chapter, maybe in the book. Oh, the dinner itself was very lavish, it was very extreme. It was 10 courses, like I said, and on the seventh course, uh, a complete string orchestra popped in and started playing away in a fashion reminiscent of pre-war Vienna. From then on, the Duke couldn't eat because he was too busy waving his arms around in time to the music, which was a favorite habit of his. Whenever I've seen him anywhere near music, out comes his conductor's complex. <laughs> I'm still dying over that weird collection of social derelicts. 
<laughs> That's awesome. Okay. Okay. Now we're taking a shift in the chapter. We're going to talk about the memoir. Whatever did come of that. Progress on the Duke's memoirs have been slow. I've read chapters 19, 20, 21, and 22, which Miss Swan sent me yesterday, and I returned them, wrote George Allen to Walter Mockton in October 1949. I do not think that His Royal Highness himself can possibly be the author of these chapters. I feel that they are so bad that I am impelled to suggest to you that it may be our duty to advise them against publication, because if they appear in their present form, they will be condemned and must do him untold injury in every quarter. Would that somebody had told the same to Harry. Do you remember when that book came out? And do you remember how many foolish reviewers tried to say that book was good? And you just had to add, ask yourself, well, did you crack the cover? It was one of the worst books I have ever read. Its literary value was of no consequence whatsoever. And I, I just, I don't know. But it seems that birds of a feather because neither Harry can write nor could his uncle. The press magnate, Lord Beaverbrook, who had been actively involved in the drama, was brought in to write the chapter about the abdication because they did not trust that the Duke could write the chapter on his own, that he was so confused and conflicted about the whole thing and had such a crooked narrative that they couldn't even expect that he could write it down. In correspondence regarding Lord Beaverbrook writing that chapter, the book says, I took the Murphy's chapters and from his material, I prepared the account marked Beaverbrook. If we decide on the Beaverbrook narrative, then we must all join together in pressing it upon the Duke. Your own authority will be required as well as my influence and we must be tactful. Murphy, of course, could not have secured from the Duke the story I've told. The Duke did not know it. He never grasped the meaning of his own crisis. It is imperative that the Duke should not have knowledge of this letter to you. He must be persuaded to recognize that these writings represent his talks with Murphy and me. So they they must think he's an idiot because they've got Lord Bieberbrook to write an account. And they're like, if the Duke sees these, we need to explain to him that this is pretty much what he said to us. We don't even need to let him realize that we've gotten other people involved on this. We need to make him think that what he said is reflected in these pages. They think he's stupid. I mean, they must. Eventually, in January 1950, it was decided that the book was ready for submission and a contract was signed with Putnam. But it was to be another year before it was delivered. In many ways, I am disappointed with the state of the work, wrote Charles Murphy to George Allen in January 1950. He goes on to say, certain chapters, notably four, five, six, seven, and eight, have never been gone over by me. They consist primarily of the original life material of the first series, partly finished notes and experimental undertakings which the Duke himself grouped together, adding various bits and pieces of his own. But stylistically, they are certainly not up to the standard of the rest. It has been like trying to make a rope of sand. Whoa, that is a fantastic mental image of what this was like. Making a rope out of sand? Excellent. I'll have to find out when I can use that. The reasons were clear. The Duke had lost interest in the book because he was focused on trying to save his marriage. In April of 1951, a King story, which recounts his life up to the abdication, was published. The Windsors launched it from the Waldorf Towers and then traveled around the States promoting it. I had editorial advice and assistance in compiling the book, of course, but I read every word of it myself. The Duke told Nancy Spain for good housekeeping, adding, I worked an average of eight hours a day, nine until one o'clock, and then four hours more between lunch and dinner. Oh, you worked on it hard, did you? Is that why the people working with you said they couldn't get anything out of you and that you'd show up drunk as a skunk every time it was time to start working? Reviews were mixed. The New York Times described the book as a character study of a well-meaning, undistinguished individual destined from birth to life of monumental artificiality. Burn. Uh, Noel Annan, reviewing the British edition in The New Statesman, thought... Reflections of inconceivable banality succeed descriptions of court life so bizarre that the characters seem permanently to be playing charades. Now, there were some good reviews. The Scotsman thought that it was, quote, well-written and lively, and The Economist said that it was, quote, a most dignified, objective, and historically valuable work whose readers will, it is safe to say, look on the throne with an enhanced and deepened respect. And The Observer found that it was frank and absorbing. But... They also said, the wisdom of publication is arguable. The hero emerges as rather a pathetic figure. Pathetic! It's the only word to use. Tommy Lassell's had no illusions about the book. 
I dare say the Duke of Windsor has written a good book, but it is wrong and disloyal for a former king of England to write such a book for profit and to sell things that are not his to sell. Now, the reviews did not prevent a King story from sitting on the bestsellers list for seven months, being translated into over 20 languages and earning the Duke more than 300,000 pounds. And as a word to all of you, I will not be reviewing that book. I know, I know. Everyone's going to be like, well, we should do that one next. No, we shouldn't. No, we shouldn't. Because it's not real. It's not really what he thought. It's a bunch of collaboration of people trying to come up with the story and putting his name on it to give him something to do. So, no. Um, but that was a weird chapter, was it not? I, I don't know. Like, I don't really know what I thought their personal lives were like. I mean, obviously, you got to do something to feel excited about life. So we're, we're, you know, we're dipping into weird, wild, mysterious ways in order to, you know, get your next dopamine hit. But... Wallace is weird. I, I mean, I never liked her, but now I really don't like her. Like, how could you treat somebody like this? You made the choice. You didn't have to get married. You could have put your foot down. You know, but she's, she's really mad at herself for being so naive as to believe she was ever going to be queen. Right? And now she's, but, but, she, but she's never going to take that blame on herself. Now it's going to be somebody else's fault. And this is what happens. She is getting to be the worst in her old age. I mean, whatever it is that people were able to find about her that was worth being around, I, I mean, I believe that is, that, 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 that shining light is beginning to dim and it's about to go out. And it just shocks me that she could like literally have ovarian cancer and, you know, be getting a hysterectomy and then just like jump right back, you know, into the party scene with young Jimmy Donahue and being like, let's go out, you know? Let's go sneak around in people's bedrooms and excuse ourselves from lunch and go and have sex upstairs. It's like, ew, like, what? I'm not saying that when you get older, you can't have fun, but like this kind of fun, the, the, the kind of fun that is just aimed at hurting and harming and spitefully injuring your husband, you didn't have to marry him. And if you don't like it, then leave, right? But just to sit around and be so cruel, that's what, that's the thing that I, I'm most annoyed about in this chapter is the cruelty of it. Because if she doesn't like him, then, and you like Jimmy better, and Jimmy gives you everything you want and all of this. And I mean, she's got no other moral compass. It's always just been like, who can give me the most? How can I angle myself to get the most gifts, presents, prestige, all of this? Well, Jimmy right now, it's, it's working out for her with Jimmy. You know, so why is she making the Duke sit there and watch all of this happen? Except for the fact that she's incredibly cruel and hateful and unkind the worst. I mean, I'm gonna tell you right now, I truly think that she may be giving Meghan Markle a run for her money. All right, I'll see you guys later. The next chapter of the Britney book will come out and that'll be our last chapter and then we'll be moving on to Matthew Perry. All right, see you later. Bye.